Assalamu alaikum thank you so much for tuning in to Kosh Musliman in the previous podcast we spoke about secularism decoloniality and kashmir now we are starting a series of podcasts called islam and the question of resisting oppression this is the first podcast in that series and today we are joined by dr uaimer anjum dr uaimer anjum is the chair of islamic studies at the department of philosophy and religious studies at the university of toledo his work focuses on the nexus of theology ethics politics and law in islam He obtained his PhD in Islamic intellectual history in the Department of History, University of Wisconsin Madison. He is the author of Politics, Law and Community in Islamic Thought: The Timian Moment. So, professor, I want to start this conversation by referring to an article that you wrote for the Yakin Institute titled Who Wants the Caliphate? And In that article there was this line that I found very profoundly meaningful in which you say that for nearly a century now Islam has not been allowed to be Islam could you please elaborate on that Yes bismillah rahman rahim alhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah thank you very much for inviting me to this podcast it's, it's an honor to be speaking to you um and on a topic that's very dear to me um Islam has not been allowed to be Islam by that I mean um in order for Muslims to prosper in the way that you find in the very foundational moment of Islam um with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when he started making his da'wah he was seeking a place where he could establish the final religion um the final manifestation of the deen of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than simply um practicing a religion right which is why when surah al-kafirun says uh you know qul ya ayyuhal kafirun and ends with la walakum dinukum wal yadin that um um very early makkan surah already declares where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says for you your religion for me mine people usually misinterpret it in sometimes even scholarly uh um individuals would mean this would take this to mean something like a liberal message which is that you practice your own religion and i won't bother you and you won't bother me but really what this meant is that there will be no compromise there will never be a point where uh, my religion will become uh you know will diffuse um into yours and uh, and i will adopt any of your uh, deen our deens are different and the deen i have is complete uh or is intended to be complete and this surah came at a time when really there was no uh sharia but the prophets uh if you will there was a um uh, there was a prospect that Allah had promised him that this deen will be established and the prophet was not willing to compromise it and we see the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam seeking aid and then making emigration to medina and there establishing the deen and the sharia uh, and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends this first al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam deena today i have completed uh, your religion and perfected my blessing on you and i am pleased with uh, islam as your deen and this the great uh, blessing of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only on uh, the muslims but this was god's final message to humanity islam began with a political moment and by political i mean one in which um islam seeks um to determine the parameters of life um in light of allah's guidance rather than um you know rendering unto caesar what is caesar's and to to you know and keeping the small and shrinking portion for religion for private life uh or turning the other cheek um this is these are not explicitly not teachings of islam and um islam seeks justice seeks to establish justice through struggle and that is what jihad was for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for much of his life and i can explain this comment later so 
establishing justice and freedom to preach la ilaha illallah to worship allah and that within that freedom allowing freedom to other people who worship allah in their own way in the way that islam deems to be incorrect nonetheless they have their right to continue that worship this is islam islam requires power not for the sake of power but um for the sake of establishing um, justice and truth and in the global order that emerged after the first world war um islam has had to um become subordinate you know in the minds of most people and intellectuals and the ruling elite which is not to say that the ulama or the, the leading scholars uh, obviously the struggle against that has been uh, has continued and gotten stronger uh, but when you look at the world of um the, you know power institutions islam has been um expelled if you will uh, and islam if you will has been pushed back into the makkan period but unlike the clarity of the makkan period which was led by the prophet alayhi salam where he is seeking to establish his deen and not willing to compromise you know this clarity is not always available to the muslim intellectual class to the ulama themselves who do not always read the political and geopolitical reality with the kind of clarity that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his people read uh, and the sahaba around him so for islam to be islam it needs to transform the world it needs to at least be engaged in the struggle um knowingly that it transformed the world rather than creating mythology um which uh, other traditions do but but that would not be true islam so justice is very much at the center the core of islam and the most important element of justice um is la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah itself um shirk is the greatest injustice but islam is just even in affirming that truth that yes shirk associating partners to allah let alone worship worshiping others uh, explicitly is great injustice but allah is just even in allowing that people are going to um believe in this kind of thing in different ways in ways that are incorrect but nevertheless they are not to be coerced la ikraha fid din um so justice really in, in so many ways is the is the heart of islam and heart of the prophet's struggle and that message has been diluted political expediency uh, intellectual confusion and perhaps most importantly um, as allama ibn khaldun had mentioned it is the uh, the great and seemingly total defeat of islam at the hands of the west um and at and then submission to various western ideologies that has rendered muslim thinkers intellectuals to um effectively worship at the altar of the conqueror um sometimes seeing the internal conflict disarray confusion incoherence but not having the courage to uh, question it so you know these are the some of the sentiments that were behind that sentence thank you so much for this elaboration and what i find interesting is that one of the oft repeated statement that we come across when we study the struggles in palestine in kashmir in east turkestan is that these struggles are not islamic but political so we are told that we should not make it about islam but i was wondering that is in this statement hinged upon the act of cordoning off of islam to a personal depoliticized realm of belief so you have these people defining islam as a religion and then religion is defined and conceptualized as it was in european modernity 
So you have this very Eurocentric conception of religion as something that is directly related to individual consciousness, as something that is related to inner experience and private belief, and not something that is related to material factors, socio-economic realities, and therefore utterly distinct from issues of power. What I was wondering is that isn't this discourse in and of itself an instrument of colonial and neo-colonial strategies of power because colonialism has a material existence. It's deeply entrenched in socio-political and economic power structures. And if you separate power from Islam or if you eviscerate Islam of its politics, you are making Islam irrelevant for those Muslims who are experiencing the condition of colonialism, occupation or oppression. You are telling them that they cannot turn to Islam when they are faced with oppression. What will you say about that? Right, absolutely. Every word that you said is correct. And um, I think the number of young scholars um, are, are beginning to recognize it very clearly. Of course, I have written about this. Professor Talal Assad has written precisely about, uh, about this. And a recent essay by um, a dear friend um, uh, who is a young emerging anthropologist uh, and sister, um, uh, Muniza Rizvi, um, on uh, Critical Muslim Studies Journal, um, which is published by Salman Sayyid, I believe. Um, she had this article called Palestine and the Question of Islam, which very eloquently um, makes the point that uh, you also uh, made very clearly, uh, which is that um, Islam is surgically separated from the question uh, of struggle, question of injustice, um, and for various reasons one of them is precisely that religion is supposed to be proper religion is uh, you know personal or is supposed to be at best communal within a religious parochial community but um, when you talk to non-muslims how could you possibly make alliances um, if uh, if you center the islamic narrative um, or in fact even the fact that it's not just muslims but christians for example in in uh, in Palestine that are suffering, but um, I think that so I think that what you said um, about this sort of internalized secularism of modernity that becomes the de facto perspective of even well-meaning Muslims, even you know decolonialist Muslims, right? So I have actually seen this from progressive decolonialist uh, religious Muslims to say, well, they're saying, well, set Islam aside. This is a question of human humanity or human humanitarian issue or a question of justice. Um, but precisely that, that a Muslim does not, uh, or rather Muslim by definition has submitted to God's definition of justice. And as such, any serious engagement with question of justice and injustice has to be powered by one's deep understanding of what is right and wrong and what the consequences of one's actions are and um, and, and, and so on. So um, I think that that is really um, these struggles, unfortunately, right, these struggles for justice, for decolonialism become site for secularization, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes very much as a result of uh, of concession that you know we simply cannot do islam here and the kind of ulama that you were pointing to the um you know who are again split and some the great ulama have uh if you will uh learn from that tradition but um, um it can also be uh, subverted uh, as can al-azhar university or what you're seeing in Saudi today um the the saudi um establishment um have they have similarly been subverted and they're all effectively singing the same tune which is that islam has nothing to do with justice resistance power accountability of those in power or solidarity with other muslims really 
for those people, Islam is submission to authority and submission to any authority. So this could even mean submission to Hindu authority or, you know, whatever secular authority that may be in power. But these people um, really do not represent either Islamic tradition uh, or even today the best of scholarship. These people are um, have always been around, but they are particularly you know, nefariously powerful in Muslim circles, the Muslim clerical circles, because of the power of the state. So if you have 80% Muslim ulama fighting against injustice, 20, uh, uh, you know, 19% not sure weighing their options and 1% vocally supporting the tyrant, well, the state is going to pick those 1% and make them representative of the 100%. And there is little that uh, these populations can do, at least for the time being, unless we begin to speak and resist. So I think that that's what's really going on with, uh, with the ulama as well. So going back to your question, um, is Palestine or is Kashmir or is the Uyghur struggle or Rohingya, uh, is this an Islamic struggle? And instead of providing a deconstruction, if you will, of colonialism, uh, which one could do, and I think which uh, Muniza Rizvi has done very well and you have done very well, I want to tell you another story. And that story begins with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emigrating to Medina. Um, when he, uh, you know, he comes to Medina, before he comes to Medina for a couple of years, he's preaching actively and looking for an alternative uh, base for his mission. He's not looking for somewhere where he can quietly practice his religion. He is looking for someone to fight with him and for him. Um, when he can, while he preaches his deen freely, right? So he goes to Ta'if and then finally people in Medina swear that they're going to fight and defend his message with their blood and uh, so that is when he goes to Medina. As soon as he goes to Medina, what does he do? Within the first six months, he establishes his mosque and establishes brotherhood. And then he starts sending expeditions to intercept the jugular vein of Qureshi economy in Mecca, people who have expelled him um, and who were, if you will, the uh, the uh, the the aristocrats of Arabia, people who had most power and influence and, and, if you will, cultural hegemony, he does not sit in Medina um, worshipping alone or teaching, you know, his companions uh, acts of worship uh, or, or mysticism. He, in fact, begins to send um, saraya, these expeditions, before the Battle of Badr, which took place in uh, um, in a year and a half after uh, the Hijrah, after the immigration of the Prophet, he had sent eight expeditions, almost one every month after he established himself initially. And um, these expeditions, four of them he led himself. They were called Ghazawat and four of them were Saraya. So the Prophet was seeking to uh, intercept Qurayshi caravans to... So what was the point of all of this? What was the Prophet trying to do, alayhi salatu wasalam? Fortunately, we have a very clear answer in the Qur'an because this is um, one of the most clearly commented on, um, you know, pr process, you know, this whole, um, the Prophet's struggle. The Qur'an was very involved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commenting on directing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam sometimes explaining or justifying what had just happened or, or directing it. And one such incident really gives a very clear sense of what these expeditions were about, which, is, which took place a month and a half before the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr took place in 17 of uh, Ramadan. Uh, this incident took place at the end of the month of uh, Rajab. Right? So it's Rajab and then Sha'ban and Ramadan. This took place in the month of Rajab, the very end, uh, last day of Rajab, Abdullah ibn Jahash, one of the Meccan companions and immigrants, 
whom the prophet had sent to do reconnaissance, to study the movement of a caravan that was coming from Yemen, uh, and it was arriving in Mecca that day. And this was, if you will, noon or afternoon, when Abdullah bin Jahash uh, sees that the caravan is rushing to reach Mecca. And once it reached Mecca, Mecca is in the recognized sanctuary, it could not be attacked. So Abdullah bin Jahash, and this is a month of Rajab, which is a sacred month, and he makes a judgment call and attacks the caravan while uh, you know this um, Rajab is not over. Rajab would be uh, end uh, in a few hours when the sun sets, as you know, that the new month begins in 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 the lunar calendar um, with sunset. Um, mm -hmm. So he rushed a few hours to intercept the caravan. A man from Quraysh is killed, and others are captured, and the caravan is brought to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ dislikes what happened. He said, I did not tell you to uh, attack. I told you to, if you will, study the movement. And uh, Abdullah bin Jahash, you know, you know, they 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 are um, uh, they're very regretful. At this point, this uh, ayah is revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ قُلْ قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ وَصَدٌ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ This ayah explains to us the reasons for why the Battle of Badr took place, why the Prophet ﷺ was intercepting the caravans, and why uh, even this uh, error, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this an error, this error of attacking someone in a sacred month was nonetheless small compared to the great enormities that had taken place, right? And this really set, tells you the truly Islamic system of thought, uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in the Quran. Like, what is a great sin versus what is an error in ritual? So the great sin, this is the verse goes, they ask you about the sacred months, uh, fighting in those months, is it good or bad? Are you allowing this? Uh, because Muslims as well as non-Muslims were now engaged in this real con this consternation, right? This propaganda back and forth. Are you guys violating the sacred months of, of the Arabs? Uh, no clear verse had come down at this time, so which explains Abdullah bin Jahash, you know, uh, taking this action while being not sure about it. Uh, but Allah says it's a sin. Fighting in these months is in fact an enormity. It is, it is not a small thing. It shouldn't have happened. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you will, change his gear and says, look, but I'll tell you what is really great and much greater, an incomparably greater sin, which is saddun an sabirillah preventing people from the, the path of Allah, the religion of the Prophet, you know, that the Prophet was preaching, alayhi salatu wasalam, wa kufrum bihi, and rejecting it. So, sad, persecution for the sake, for, for religion, and then preventing people from becoming Muslim, and of course, rejecting it, rejecting the truth itself. And then, wal masjid al-harami, and preventing people from the sacred mosque as the Meccans were preventing now the Muslims in Medina from, from, from visiting. And then, وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ And expelling its people from it, from that land. So if you look at this order of things, uh, persecution, rejection of faith or unbelief, and expelling people for, for, um, from uh, their homes. Um, this, right, all of these persecution, religious persecution, unbelief, and expulsion of people, and preventing them, right, these three or four causes are given, and in fact, these causes are repeated over and over. These were the causes for why the Prophet ﷺ was engaged in this jihad. Later, we learn in, in Surah Al-Mumtahina that unbelief in itself was not the sufficient cause if these people so for example um the surah al-mumtahana says um 
لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم ان تبروهم وتقسطوا اليهم that Allah is not prohibiting you from being kind and compassionate and virtuous toward those unbelievers who have not fought you for their religion and who have not expelled you from your homes who have not persecuted you from for your religion and who have not supported this persecution so these things this means that the real cause for the jihad of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right when he is in fact taking active um um you know this is he he's taking the war to the meccans meccans are not fighting medinas this is often a point that is glossed over and misunderstood the prophet alaihi salam is the one who is fighting the Meccans, intercepting their caravans, and they wanted to avoid it. Um, but the reason for the Prophet for doing that is because they were expelled from their homes, because there was grave injustice, because there was persecution for religion, and there was, um, they were, these were people who were ظاهروا, they were helping others. They were conspiring to prevent Muslims from practicing their religion and making their life difficult. So there were Muslims who were left in Mecca. They were being actively persecuted. And those who had been, um, you know, of course, had left Medina. They had left all their wealth and property and their lives behind that they could not recover. Um, so these were the reasons. In other words, everything that is happening in Palestine and everything that is happening in Kashmir, right? And what is happening in um, uh, Eastern uh, Turkestan, which is occupied part, uh, which is occupied by China, you know, the Uyghur or Rohingya in Myanmar, these, their struggles are exactly the struggles for which the Prophet ﷺ fought the Battle of Badr. So for those who say that struggle against people who persecute you for your religion for who do not give you your freedom to practice and to determine um, your belonging this is not islamic then the prophet was not very islamic on these views right absolutely and it's also important to remember that the problem is not that the indian state stops Kashmiri Muslims from praying five times a day or that it stops them from observing Hajj. The problem is that for a Muslim, one must not have to seek permission from an earthly temporal authority and that to an illegitimate one at that for worshipping God. We must have the power to organize our individual and communal life, our political life according to the principles of Islam without having to seek permission from any other authority because for us the locus of sovereignty is Allah himself and not a colonial state and for many Muslims who resist settler colonialism who resist occupation or oppression this struggle is not an end in and of itself so they see this struggle as a means towards the formation of a free community in which Islam could be empowered again in which the process of Islam's depoliticization, Islam's evisceration and emasculation could be reversed. So they don't see liberation as an end in and of itself, but they see it as a means towards something. So Professor, I came across the saying of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, in which he's reported to have said that whoever is killed protecting his property is a martyr. Whoever is killed protecting his religion is a martyr. Whoever is killed protecting his life is a martyr, and whoever is killed protecting his family is a martyr. Now, I found this saying of the Prophet very fascinating because not just is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, legitimizing these struggles, but he is also sanctifying and attaching a promise of reward to a death that might reach one while leading these struggles. So, when the Muslims of Kashmir or Palestine resist settler colonialism, these are precisely the realms of life, the things that they are defending against the violence of the colonial state. The violence could be physical, it could be epistemic, but these are the things that they are guarding against the colonial state. They are protecting their legitimate property and wealth. As we know, in any settler colonial project, 
the stealth of land the stealth of property is an intrinsic and central part and then you talk about religion for long the indian state has tried to remake islam and popularize a distorted interpretation of islam that would make islam compatible with india's colonial rule in kashmir and then you talk about life any struggle against occupation and colonialism is a struggle for the preservation of life and then you talk about family for long the indian state has broken families and murdered people in kashmir so what i want to ask you is that is the saying of the prophet limited to just an individual muslim or can a community of muslims that is leading all these struggles for such a long time also find hope and relevance in this saying of the prophet well absolutely this is a, this is a great question and many layers to it but let me answer that again in the same kind of way that i've tried to answer the other questions that is through the sirah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and through the quran when people like um bilal al habashi radiyallahu anhu uh who only knows of islam ahadun ahad right he only knows that muhammad there is a man named muhammad who is claiming that there is only one god and uh, bilal being from abyssinia probably uh, christian or or aware of christianity is familiar with monotheism he immediately believes and begins to uh, claim la ilaha illallah i believe in the mess in, in the religion of muhammad imagine if he had died in that would he not be the shaheed or the greatest of shuhada and people like ammar uh, ammar's father and mother yasir and sumayya were they not the first martyrs of islam um of course you know the, these are this is these are the martyrdoms on which islam islam's later success is based and uh, this is the foundation of what faith means to us right in many ways if you were to go ask uh, uh bilal or um yasir or sumayya right anything of the establishment of the the system of islam they would have no clue what they're what you're talking about what they would say is that we will not budge from being muslim we are identifying with muhammad At this point ali salatu wassalam islam is merely identifying with the call of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and why kashmiris are being uh, persecuted is because they identified with the call of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam whatever they know of it right so in any struggle mm -hmm. there are going to be people with different images different um, different visions and different levels of understanding um there are going to be uh, and and it is important uh for the the ulama and for the leaders to be deeply steeped in the quran in the vision of the quran and the vision of uh, and solidarity with the umma um otherwise it might you know this struggle might become reduced to a um a, a national um national conflict and that would be used against uh, muslims uh, and against the struggle Uh, by the colonial state itself because it can change the narrative um so in my view this kind of you know the, the, the immediate answer to your question is yes absolutely this struggle is islamic to protect yourself your life your property because you're being persecuted for your religion but at the same time this is not where the uh intellectuals the leaders the thought leaders the ulama should stop that it's not merely that we are protecting our life that right this is not the end of our struggle uh but rather it is for something greater that we identify with the struggle with the message of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and with the rest of the umma and there is a decolonial aspect to our religion which to our struggle which is very much part of our religion our deen as well but that again is not the end of it right that is just part of it the heart of this struggle is to go back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to reclaim the solidarity of the ummah that is uh, to complete 
uh, completely submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every way that we know this which which cannot be done without having uh, complete self-determination and without the khilafa, without the sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these can be very much seen as um, you know, yeah, the various layers of understanding that people have in this struggle. And this does not delegitimate the struggle of the, the father who is trying to simply protect his house. If his struggle, if his purpose to protect his house uh, and his family is to continue the deen, to continue uh, and to protect the responsibility uh, and that Allah has given him, Right, that's the base level of struggle that is Islamic. If the father is doing so or the brother is doing so because he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he believes that this is a small part of a larger struggle, then your ajr is that much greater than your vision and your level of strength and your level of patience um, and your ability to uh, to secure victory is that much greater. If you look at the struggle of Kashmir, people are being prevented from being Muslim and flourishing as Muslim. Uh, if you look at Uyghur, right, they are being persecuted precisely because they would not submit to a Kafir state that has, in fact, occupied their territory. Um, and they are being, of course, the kinds of crimes that China is committing or India is committing are far greater. That is, even one Muslim had they killed unjustly, uh, they would have to pay for it. They are killing and raping and committing effective genocide or ethnic cleansing, right? It's really religious cleansing, but we don't have a category for it. But if you will, the Quran has this category, the center that, you know, this religious community that you're trying to eliminate, this is the greatest crime. It is greater than killing. So what, um, these struggles are not only legitimate, they are in fact the sites where Islam is still can, can still be understood, preserved, and regenerated from because Islam came at a time of such a struggle where the meaning of the Qur'an and the struggle of the Prophet ﷺ come to life. Um, they don't come to life in, in Riyadh or Cairo or places where these palaces where uh, this elite, they're making uh, th these deals um, and right there where, where they are, or even at the universities where they're elaborating on um, some minutia here and there. Those are all sub secondary things if they do not have the heart, which is the struggle for their deen. So for those, of course, and again, in any of these struggles, there will be people who will, uh, you, you know, succumb they will not succumb in their struggle, but they will succumb ideologically and religiously to the uh, the language of the colonizer, the language of the uh, oppressor, uh, by embracing this as a mere secular or national issue, and giving up deen in their um, in not only in their public life, which is going to which is an error, but even sometimes in their private lives. Right, in, even in their personal beliefs, which which also one leads to the other inevitably. Uh, if Islam becomes, as you said correctly, if Islam becomes irrelevant to the most important moral struggles of your people, um, then it really becomes uh, irrelevant to your moral life. Uh, you may hold on to it only as a ritual, um, but you know that it makes no rational sense for me to be fighting in the name of decoloniality. Um, and, you know, that's to me, if that's the most moral thing for me for which I'm living and dying, and Islam for me is merely a 
a struggle of sort of a private, uh, you know, spiritual therapy, then spiritual therapy you can do away with any time. That's absolutely true. And unfortunately, with this, our podcast comes to an end. It was fascinating speaking to you, Professor Oemir. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be releasing another podcast in this series of Islam and the question of resisting oppression, hopefully next week, in which we'd be speaking about Tawheed, power and politics. We'd be talking about how moral uprightness of the cause is not enough and how it is upon the people of truth to give power to truth. Thank you for listening to us. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.